Uh, gentlemen, will you please take your seats so we can begin today's conference? I take a great deal of pleasure in presenting to you today as our guest speaker, Dr. Werner von Braun. Dr. <laughs> Braun. Gentlemen, the conquest of outer space is the greatest technological challenge of the age in which we live. The first decisive step in the conquest of space will be the placing of an object into an orbit wherein it will indefinitely circle the Earth. It takes a speed of approximately 18,000 miles per hour to accomplish this. And this is approximately three times the greatest speed ever attained by rockets today. How can we reach such a speed? First of all, of course, one could think of improving propellants used in present-day rockets. Secondly, we could shave some weights of our designs. But with both these uh, methods, it does not appear possible to gain more than approximately 40 or 50 percent of the speeds that rockets reach today. You see a model of a three-stage rocket in this picture. Up to this lower white line here is the first stage. It is powered by a number of rocket engines which will lift the missile off the ground until it has reached after approximately one minute operating time, a maximum speed in the order of 3,600 to 4,000 miles per hour. At this point, the first stage is jettisoned. Its tanks are now burned out, and the rocket motors of the second stage take over. The second stage adds a velocity increment of approximately six to 8,000 feet per second to that of the first stage. And uh, after this speed of approximately 12,000 feet per second has been reached, the second stage, likewise exhausted, would be dropped. Now the rocket motor in the last or top stage will take over. This top stage will now forge ahead at an initial speed of approximately 12,000 miles per hour until the final orbital speed of 18,000 miles has been reached. This speed is sufficient to keep the top stage in the orbit. Now, what exactly makes an orbit tick? Imagine you put a gun on top of a mountain and fire it in horizontal direction. The gravitational pull of the Earth will pull the bullet down towards the ground, and after having traveled a certain distance, the bullet will finally strike the ground. Now, as we increase the muzzle velocity, the bullet will travel farther. And at a certain speed, the curvature caused by the gravitational pull of the Earth, which pulls the bullet down, will exactly match the curvature of the Earth. The bullet will then keep on flying around the Earth and will f fall and fall, never being able to reach the surface of the Earth until it finally hits the breech of the gun from the rear. This is an orbit. You can establish such orbits at various altitudes. Theoretically, you could establish one immediately above the ground, but of course, interference with the atmosphere would slow the bullet down and the orbit wouldn't be stable. So we have to go outside of the atmosphere. But once we are outside of the atmosphere, we have a free choice of any altitude we want. And the higher we go, the slower will be the velocity required to balance the gravitational pull of the Earth. For it is the centrifugal force in the curved orbit that cancels the gravitational pull of the Earth and keeps the object in its stable orbit. Here we have replaced the top stage of the rocket by a winged airplane type stage which would carry personnel to the orbit. This winged top stage would attain the same orbital conditions as the non-winged version that you saw on the previous slide, but with the help of these wings, the top stage would be able to return to the Earth. The rocket would then go into an elliptic orbit, which after going halfway around the Earth would reach an apogee, whose altitude depends only on the excess velocity over circular orbital speed that we had at the moment of cutoff. We allow the rocket to continue through this elliptical trajectory. It would go back to the perigee, the lowest point, which was identical 
with the cutoff point of the last stage and would stay in such an elliptic orbit again forever. Now when I say forever, I have to qualify this. Every time the rocket would go through the perigee, only 60 miles up, it would be retarded slightly by the aerodynamic drag caused by the traces of the atmosphere that are still found at that altitude. So every time it would go through the perigee, it would lose a little bit of that excess speed, and as a result, the next apogee would be somewhat lower. And this gradual loss in excess speed would gradually lead to a conversion of the elliptic orbit into a circular orbit 60 miles up. And after this has been accomplished, the, missile would be, uh, the ship would be subjected to atmospheric drag throughout the entire flight around the Earth. And from then on, of course, it would lose speed rather rapidly. But with the help of the wings, it would be able to land again. If it had no wings, it would descend into the deeper atmosphere, ultimately burn up and crash. One of the most important tasks in preparing a crew for such rocket ships will be to make this crew work as a team under these harsh acceleration conditions. The tool to train teams for this condition is the centrifuge. Now centrifuge, like the one you see on this picture here, are in use in the armed forces to check people for their blackout limits. By adopting the same principle and just making the nacelle at the tip of that centrifuge larger, we can place an entire crew into the nacelle and train them as a team. This is shown here on the next picture. We have a, an entire replica of the passenger nacelle attached to the boom of the centrifuge. We cannot only whirl it around and expose the men to acceleration, we can even rotate the uh, nacelle as it swings around to simulate erratic flight conditions under which the crew must likewise take the necessary emergency measures. What causes weightlessness and when does it occur in rocket ships? You often hear that weightlessness is encountered only after a ship has left the gravitational field of the Earth. This is not true. Weightlessness in a rocket ship actually occurs the moment the engines are cut off and the ship is coasting freely and outside of the atmosphere through at any trajectory on orbit for that matter. What causes weightlessness? Weight as we know it is actually the cause not only of gravity but also of the floor on which we stand and which prevents us from freely following the pull of gravity. In other words, it always takes gravity and a rigid support to create the sensation of weight. As you withdraw that support and permit a body to freely follow the pull of gravity, that body is weightless. If you jump from a diving board into the water, you are weightless for a second or so until you hit the water. And if you are flying in a rocket ship that is not powered, your body is subjected to the same laws of motion that the ship is subjected to in which you travel. As a result, there can be no differential forces between you and the ship, and you will float freely within the cabin of the ship. What will happen when man is subjected to this condition? Well, we know that a man can eat and drink even in a horizontal position, and if you try it, you find that you can even eat upside down. Will the blood circulation be affected? Medical doctors think that it will not because the uh, most important factor in the blood circulation is the drag, the resistance of the blood in the veins and the arteries. And gravity plays only a minor part in it. Well, in fact, you can lie horizontally in your bed and you can get up and your heart circulation is hardly affected. But nobody knows today how extended weightlessness <coughs> will affect people. Some doctors believe the most critical question will be the uh, sense of equilibrium in the inner ear. There's a little pebble in the inner ear, both inner ears, called the ortholytes, which rests on some hairs, and on whichever hairs they rest is an indication this is down. If you move your head forwards, that pebble moves on a, another set of hairs, and you have a different indication of the plumb-bob direction. Under weightless conditions, 
This pebble, of course, is in, uh, disoriented and it simply floats without touching any hair or may erratically touch a hair here and a hair there. And the question is, how will you react? The feeling is some people may get seasick, maybe they can get used to it. On the right side of this picture, you see a large wheel-shaped sta space station, which uh, should be construed more or less as a proposal as to what you could possibly do with a space station, and it is not necessarily a proposal that a space station must look exactly like this thing, in particular must be that large. In fact, it can be a lot smaller if you want to reduce the equipment aboard, or prefer to have several smaller ones. The wheel shape has been chosen for the purpose of doing away with the permanent weightless condition prevailing in the orbit. By putting a spin on such a wheel, you could provide an artificial or synthetic gravity in the rim. The wheel would simply spin slowly about its hub, and by putting the right spin on, you can either simulate 1g acceleration in the rim, or one third of a g if that's considered sufficient. At any rate, you can give people their weight back. The people, of course, would live in the rim. Now, how, how would it be possible to build such a large station in an orbit, and how could we bring the equipment up to do this? The cargo holds in even large rocket ships will always be limited, so one of the most important things will be that, it, that you can ship the parts up small enough so they can be stowed away in the cargo holds. One way of doing it would be to fold them together. And in this particular proposal, I had envisioned to build the space station of 10 or 15 segments of rubber impregnated fiberglass or some material similar to that used in rubber floats or rubber rafts and put the ring-shaped space station together from these sections. After the assembly has been completed and all the sections have been joined together, the entire unit can be inflated like an automobile tire, and this would provide not only the necessary rigidity to the structure, but also the atmosphere within the tire in which people could live. Of course, for an extended stay, it would be necessary to replenish the air and provide an air conditioning system and oxygen replenishing system and CO2 removal system in, uh, the, uh, in the station. Inside, such a space station may contain all sorts of uh, equipment. There will be laboratories in the rim where phenomena can be studied which are not accessible to experimentation on the ground. Such experiments may include questions involving biological and zoological life under the conditions of outer space, cosmic radiation, meteorological research, whereby the Earth can be observed from the outside, astronomical laboratories, etc. Close to the space station, there will be a powerful telescope. If you aim this telescope at the heavens, you can see the planets unblurred by atmospheric effects, and we can expect to be able to take photographs of planets like Mars or Jupiter which, uh, with uh, unprecedented clarity. As far as um, the military's application of the station is concerned, it seems even feasible to use such a platform in space as a base for the bombing of objects on the ground. And it is my opinion that such bombing could be carried out with an unprecedented accuracy from such a station. The most important application of a space station, however, will be that it can serve as a jump-off basis for trips into deeper space. Once we are in the orbit, we, need, we can disregard a lot of the requirements required for rockets capable of ascending to an orbit. In the first place, we can completely forget about aerodynamic drag and streamlining because any flights into deeper space will be outside of the atmosphere. Secondly, once we have attained orbital flight, we can break away from such an orbit and go out into deeper space with very low thrust ratings. The reason for this is simple. The weight of any ship circling in the orbit is already sustained by the centrifugal force in the orbit. So any pound of thrust you apply to an orbiting object in the right direction, 
will enhance the speed and therefore carry the object further away from the Earth. And such acceleration of deep, uh, deep space ships can be carried out virtually with micro G's of acceleration. Of course, before we can fly people to the orbit, it would be necessary to provide ways and means of returning people. And it is my opinion that the return from an orbit is a task much more formidable than attainment of orbital flight itself. In other words, the problem of hurling a small object or even an instrumented object into a satellite orbit that is not Earth returnable is essentially a question of brute force. But to return people safely from an orbit is a question that involves all faculties of modern physical science. The reason for this is simple. We cannot afford to land a spaceship from an orbit by slowing it down from its orbital speed with propellants. The reason for this is easy to see. We have to destroy the same energy on the way down that we imparted on the object to bring it up there in the first place. This would mean we roughly would need the same amount of propellants to land a ship with rocket power alone then it was necessary to bring it up there and of course this fuel would constitute payload for the ascent so initially the ship must be much larger if it were uh, to carry enough fuel for the descent. But there's a shortcut to this problem. If we depend on aerodynamic deceleration during the descent, we can put the atmosphere to use to slow us down again. But this means that the ship must re-enter the atmosphere of a speed at a speed comparable to the orbital speed of 18,000 miles per hour and from this speed we must gradually slow the ship down again. And this for, it creates a formidable aerodynamic heating problem. Of course, if we would descend at these high speeds directly into the deeper layers of the atmosphere, our ship would obviously burn up and uh, we wouldn't have a chance of building it uh, sturdy enough and make uh, in, in such fashion that people could survive the trip. But if we equip the ship with wings, we can glide it out. We can retard the ship at very high altitudes where the density isn't high enough to create too much heat flux and we simply radiate the heat out from the wings. The ship will still get pretty hot in the process, but we can keep it at the high altitudes provided our wings are large enough. Now this is the upper stage of an orbital ship that as would be required to come down. The amazing thing about such Earth returnable wing upper stages is that their landing speed would be extremely low. In fact, this ship would land at something like 60 miles an hour. It is not that we couldn't make it land faster, but we have to provide it with relatively large wings in order to be able to decelerate it at sufficiently high altitudes. So it is the heating problem that governs the wing size and not the landing speed. And when you figure it out, it, it so happens that the wing loading must be so low to achieve this that the landing speed of this empty can with no fuel aboard and just the passenger aboard would be so low that the landing speed is actually in the order of 60 miles an hour. This then would terminate the trip to the orbit. During the approach, on the approach to the landing field, the ship would run out a tricycle landing gear and finally land on the strip like a normal airplane. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, Dr. Von Braun has kindly consented to answer any questions you may have, and I presume that you'll have lots of them. Uh, Commander Finn, do you have a question? Dr. Von Braun, it has been said that you could bomb the Earth with extreme accuracy from a space satellite, say with guided missiles. Would you, within the classification, explain why it would be easier to bomb New York from a satellite than from, say, a plane or a land-launched guided missile. Let me make a little sketch to explain the problem. Suppose this here is the Earth, and this is an orbit around the Earth to which the space station is traveling in this direction. Now, if you fire a guided missile backwards, from the space station, imparting upon it something like 400 meters per second or approximately 1,000 feet per second, 
in the opposite direction, then the total speed of this missile will be 18,000 miles per hour minus that little velocity you imparted them from the opposite, in the opposite direction. As a result, your guided missile will still go through an orbit, but this orbit will be an elliptical orbit. And you can choose a velocity here where this perigee point here just fringes the upper layer, layers of the atmosphere. Now it is important to note that during this entire flight through this ellipse of descent of the guided missile, space station and missile will always be very close together because they are both going along like this. At this point here where the perigee is reached, the missile will, have, uh, will be a little bit ahead of the space station because it's period of half revolution, the time required to travel from here to here, is shorter than for the space station that goes from here to here. As a result, it will be slightly angular in angularity ahead of the space station. At this point, the station will be here and the missile will be here. Now the missile begins a glide through the atmosphere. It is a winged missile and will descend deeper and deeper into the atmosphere. But during this entire flight, the space station will stay overhead. So it can keep track of the missile, even during this phase. And since the missile loses speed here, where the space station does not, the space station will catch up angularly with the missile again. So as the target finally comes in view, see, this is the target, the space station will still be overhead, and the missile will be here. So during the entire flight of the missile, you maintain a line of sight between the space station of the missile. And as you approach the target finally, even the target will come in the line of sight and see the target and the missile simultaneously. The missile would carry a radar beacon and either an optical telescope or a radar telescope can be bracketed at the target and with a little computer in the space station, which would be comparable to a computer and anti-aircraft missile, you can simply make these two lines of sight match at the moment of impact. Now, this is a method that cannot be used with intercontinental ballistic missiles. You never have the advantage of seeing the target. Here, you have that advantage. So it is even feasible to fire at moving targets, such as ships on the seas, by using this principle. And you need not know the geographic coordinates either, with uh, which some of the people on the other side of the Iron Curtain do not publish, usually. So as long as you see the object and can keep track of your missile by means of a radar beacon, you can shoot at it even if you don't know the exact location and even if it's a moving target. Hope this answers your question. Commander Rogers? Uh, doctor, uh, what system of communications will be used in outer space? Do you mean communication between the Earth and the, uh, and the space platform? Yes, between the Earth and the space platform. Essentially radio. There's only one complication in this radio system that uh, lies in the fact that the space station travels over a substantial portion of the Earth all the time and you cannot communicate with any point on Earth all the time with the space station. It requires a whole network of radio stations on the ground and only a few stations can be in contact with the station at one time. Short waves across the ionosphere quite easily and it is an established fact uh, we have lots of experience in ballistic missiles today to know that we can penetrate the ionosphere quite easily with radio. Commander Reed? Doctor, what system of man would be used to locate a spaceship? Do you mean navigation for the crew of the ship? In other words, how would the crew navigate a ship to the... How would you uh, navigate a spaceship from point A to point B in space? Well, if you points are close together, you could do it optically. You would determine the position of point B to which you are traveling against the background of the stars, determine its position and motion, and then uh, feed the necessary correction into your speed so as to match this point at the predetermined time. Now, if it's a navigation problem of, uh, over greater distances, such as, uh, shall we say, the rendezvous problem, one new the arriving spaceship with a space station, you would uh, apply 
techniques like taking radar bearings or optical bearings. And if the question is to set up the ship for a return maneuver to the Earth, that you want to land at a certain predetermined spot on the Earth, the uh, emphasis would be on putting the right attitude on the ship for the initial landing maneuver and also time it properly. And this can be done with clocks, signals from the ground, and also with determining your position above the ground, simply by measuring uh, what uh, point you are just flying, passing over from the surface of the Earth. For greater distances from the Earth, uh, star occultation measurements behind the rim of the Earth and the Moon are a very effective way of maneuvering. So I think navigation will be carried out with different means, but most of them will be optically and by means of radar. Carl mm -hmm. Haberger. Doctor, what would be the expected lifespan of a spaceship considering that it might collide with uh, meteorites or dust particles in space? And could any protective means be devised to uh, increase this lifespan? The question of lifetime and protection uh, go closely together. It is known from shooting star observations that the frequency of abundance of uh, small meteors increases as their size decreases. So uh, the smaller ones are to fear, and the big ones are few and far between in outer space. Now, fortunately, the small ones can be warded off quite easily with a relatively thin armor of dural or metal, even or steel. Even uh, the skin of a normal airliner would give you protection against shooting stars up to about 16th magnitude. If you want to have a little more, you may have to use steel to do it but uh, the weight penalty wouldn't be severe. In fact, the hull itself provides already quite a little bit of protection. Uh, Dr. Fred Whipple, the Harvard Astronomical Observatory, has proposed to use so-called meteor bombers to protect rocket ships and space stations from this meteor danger. The principle of such a meteor bomber is simple. It is nothing but a thin <coughs> steel or dural skin spaced about an inch or two outside of the inner hull of the rocket or space station and the meteor impinging upon the surface would simply evaporate due to the impact and it may put a little dent in the meteor bumper but not harm the surface underneath. If the meteor is large enough to penetrate this bumper it will explode or rip quite a substantial hole into this thing because the effect is very much that of a surface explosion on the metal, because all the kinetic energy is immediately transformed into heat. To answer your question of lifetime, we think we can provide protection without an undue weight penalty, a shooting star up to about 12 or maybe 14th magnitude, which still means tiny little particles not larger than a grain of salt. But those are the ones really to fear. With such a protection, it is possible to protect a ship or space station for a period of say five or ten years. That is of course a statistical figure. It means the likelihood of a penetration would be one penetration in five or ten years. You can easily step this up to ten years or a hundred years or a thousand years by just providing slightly more material on the meteor bumper. So I think uh, this is not nearly as tricky a problem as the protection of pressurized bombing planes against bullets. Colonel White. Doctor, my question has to do with velocities in space. From what I have read and what I have gathered from your discussion here today, I have formulated an opinion that uh, theoretically there is no limit to the speed that man can reach in space. Would you care to comment on this, sir? As far as rockets are concerned, and they are probably the only conceivable vehicles to build up very great speeds in outer space, there is uh, no practical, uh, no theoretical limit in sight. There's a very definite practical limitation set by the amount of fuel that such a rocket can carry. And it's one of the reasons that uh, the first uh, endeavor will be concentrated upon putting something into an orbit 